Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for attending this morning's co-sponsored webinar by Imbibe and Ghanadin on the top three trending ingredients of 2017, sugar reduction, protein, and probiotics. There was so much content that we wanted to cover for today, and of course, there's never enough time. So if you'd like to learn more about any of the topics we're going to cover, or if you have questions, we very much encourage you to follow up with us after the webinar. Um, both of our contact information will be up on the screen. My name is Laura Dembitzer, and I'm the Marketing Director here at Imbibe. Imbibe is a beverage development company right outside of Chicago. We formulate all different types of beverages, teas, coffees, dairy, dairy alternatives, protein beverages, carbonated soft drinks, and more. And we design and sell the custom ingredients and custom flavors that go into the beverages that we develop. So we work on a lot of different projects and different applications for both food service and retail clients. And of course, our main focus at Imbibe is product development and formulation, but we also provide critical insights, trends, and new innovations that help inform the projects we work on. So for today's presentation, I'm going to be sharing some marketing and technical insights on sugar reduction and protein, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mike Bush from Ghana Aiden to talk about what's trending with probiotics. We'll get into the ingredients in just a minute, but I wanted to first mention some of the major trends that are propelling the growth and popularity of the ingredients we're speaking about. Some of those mega trends include convenience, clean label, the importance of having some kind of health halo around your product, and the functional food trend. According to Nielsen, Convenience was deemed the most important trend driver of food sales in 2016. Consumers are gravitating towards products with cleaner labels, shorter ingredient statements, pronounceable ingredients, or the exclusion of ingredients that are deemed unhealthy, like high fructose corn syrup or preservatives. Consumers also are demanding more value out of their food and beverages, and many consumers look for products offer function, function naturally, meaning they deliver some type of auxiliary health benefit. The growth of the functional food and beverage category is expected to reach $279 billion by 2021, which represents a 60% increase from 2014. These are some of the main consumer values that are influencing product innovation and new product launches. Sugar reduction, protein, and probiotics all very much align with those mega food and beverage trends and have become pervasive in products across food and beverage categories. So as I'm sure you all know, the FDA regulation will go into effect as of, at the end of July 2018 that all nutrition facts must declare added sugar and total sugar. Lower sugar content has been in consumer demand for a long time, but now with the changing nutrition facts panel, there's going to be an even greater emphasis on reducing sugar content across product categories. Food and beverage brands of all sizes and product types are implementing initiatives for sugar reduction. I'm going to mention a few of those major brands and their initiatives to illustrate how widespread sugar reduction has become. Large corporations like Coke and Pepsi have modified some of their formulations to reduce sugar content in their products. In the fall of 2016, Pepsi changed the name of an existing product line, which is a marketing nightmare, from Pepsi Max to Pepsi Zero Sugar. Very clearly communicates to consumers the product has no sugar. Pepsi actually also announced in October 2016 that by 2025, at least two-thirds of its drinks will have 100 calories or fewer from added sugar per 12 ounce serving. By 2020, Coke said that it would offer low calorie, no calorie, and or no calorie options in every market as product as part of its sustainability goals. Nestle just announced that they're currently waiting for a patent on a sugar reduction process that might allow them to cut sugar across categories by 40%. They're hoping to incorporate this process into products by 2018. Even product lines where sugar is an essential component of the product identity are being forced to reformulate in order to be relevant or stay relevant to today's consumers. Smuckers, for example, who is known for their jams and jellies, has, now has a line of products called Smuckers Low Sugar. And another way they've repositioned their products to appear more healthful is by launching a line of products with the tagline, naturally sweetened with honey. 
And this is an approach that we see many brands undertaking, offering two separate lines of products, one that's zero calorie or no calorie, which would typically contain some high intensity sweeteners for calorie conscious consumers, and then also offering a product line that's more naturally positioned for consumers who are not necessarily looking for lower calories, but want something with more of a health halo and that doesn't contain artificial sweeteners. The juice category specifically is undergoing some major R&D to reduce sugar. Um, for example, Trop 50 was one of the most successful new product launches for Tropicana between 2007 and 2012. Uh, that formulation is different from their conventional orange juice because it's made with a stevia-based sweetener. And the marketing claims around sugar reduction on the front panel of products have increased dramatically over the past few years. The claim sugar-free grew 14%. Uh, the fastest growing claim is low sugar, with, which had a 32% increase, and the no sugar added claim has increased 21%, and the period we're talking here is from 2011 to 2015, and this is globally. Interestingly, the no sugar added claim has, um, doesn't really say much about the sugar content of the product, because especially on a juice-based product, where majority of the sugar is going to be coming from the juice. Uh, for example, there's a cold-pressed juice brand, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, 1915. It's owned by Bolthouse. They have one product, for example, called Romaine that's positioned as a green juice made from romaine, cucumber, spinach, and kale that has the, the no-sugar added claim right on the front channel, but the product has 25 grams of total sugar, which is half of the new daily recommendation. Other ways can, uh, brands are communicating about sugar reduction is by doing a sugar content comparison, so saying, you know, X grams less sugar or percentage of less sugar compared to their original version. Also, in order to give a more natural positioning, brands make the claim no artificial sweetener. So now let's talk more specifically about the sweetener technologies on the market that companies are utilizing in order to reduce sugar content. Consumers are looking for products that are low sugar and clean label. Clean label meaning they're from natural sources. Some of the trending natural alternatives to sugar include honey, even though honey is more caloric than sugar, agave, and fruit juice. Interestingly, once the nutrition, the new nutrition facts panel goes into effect, if you want to add juice to sweeten your beverage, um, as opposed to sugar, and not have it be counted on that added sugar panel, uh, as added sugar on the nutrition panel, it has to be added at a single strength as opposed to a concentrate. The sweetness of agave, honey, and syrups is often not as intense as sugar, yet they still deliver four calories per gram, which means when used alone, you might not necessarily be able to achieve that same sweetness as sugar. But the major trend in sugar reduction technology is focused on natural, non-nutritive sweeteners, non-nutritive high-intensity sweeteners. So there's a few technologies here that I want to highlight. The first is a class of sweeteners that is derived from the stevia plant. Although stevia has been on the market for many years now, it's still undergoing a tremendous amount of research and development in order to improve the taste profile. In addition to stevia that is used to sweeten food and beverages, there are also stevia derivatives on the market that are specifically designed to be used as flavor enhancers and therefore fall under the natural flavor on the ingredient statement, provided that certain predetermined use rate limitations are met. This regulation can be confusing and sticky so make sure you're always communicating very clearly with your product development team and your regulatory team to make sure your product is labeled properly. Another sweetener technology that you're probably familiar with is monk fruit. Monk fruit does have a pretty strong aftertaste, and it's also not legal in the European Union, which is one of the reasons that I think it's not being widely used. There are some sweetener blends on the market that use monk fruit in conjunction with stevia, but many of our product developers here at Imbibe don't recommend that because they feel that monk fruit acts just like stevia and gives you a big hit of that sweetness up front. Um, monk fruit is also commonly paired with erythritol, uh, which leads me to the next group of sweeteners I want to talk about, the sugar alcohols. Sugar alcohols have been around for a while, but now they're becoming popular again, or I guess much more popular, um, because they don't have a strong aftertaste and they have a, a very even sweetness profile that acts like sugar. Some common sugar alcohols include erythritol, mannitol, sorbitol. Um, on an ingredient statement, they would be labeled as sugar alcohols with a specific sugar alcohol name in parentheses, or you can just state the name of the sugar alcohol. You probably recognize sorbitol from sugar-free gum. 
And if you are familiar with the byproducts or by five, that beverage definitely contributed to the popularity of using erythritol to sweeten beverages. They are considered natural, and erythritol has about 70% of the sweetness impact of sugar, yet it maintains a similar bulk density to sugar. So that makes it an attractive partner to other high intensity sweeteners because the combination generally provides a sweetness profile and mouthfeel comparable to sugar. Erythritol also helps mask off, off flavors and lingering aftertastes associated with some stevia-based sweeteners. The last sweetener I want to mention is called Allulose. It's very new to the market and it's not widespread right now because it only has grass certification for certain applications. It's a no-calorie sweetener with a similar molecular structure to sugar. It provides the mouthfeel of table sugar along with 70%, about 70% of its sweetness. It also browns like sugar, which makes it attractive uh, for certain product applications. Here at Imbibe, we've actually been developing some proprietary sweetness enhancer technologies to either reduce the amount of sugar in a beverage or replicate the impact of low amounts of sugar, how low amounts of sugar would act on, the, on an overall flavor, so helping deliver a slightly sweetened beverage. So we're definitely experiencing this trend for sugar reduction firsthand in many projects our team is working on. Lastly, I think it's just important to remember that sweeteners don't work autonomously in a beverage. Colors, flavors, functional ingredients, proteins, all impact an individual's response and affect what a consumer might describe as sweetness. And that brings us to the next category of protein. Food manufacturers continue to rebrand and roll out new products that prominently feature protein claims. The protein content in, um, continues to increase with each the protein content and can, continues to increase with each new product launch. Proteins called out in traditional categories like nutrition bars and shakes, and less conventional platforms like chips, snacks, jerky, ice cream, coffee, and cereal. Even candy bars call out protein content. In a recent Mintel survey, consumers were asked what their ideal attribute would be on a variety of prospective drink categories. Consumers said that they want to see protein fortification, fortification in 25% of their ideal carbonated soft drinks, bottled water, tea, non-dairy milk, coffee, and nutritional drinks. So let's take a look at the presence of protein in a few different categories. Snack products certainly vary in terms of how nutritious they are. Uh, notice that Baby Ruth, for example, a candy bar now calls out four grams of protein. Even potato chips are being fortified with protein. Um, the, there's the Quest chips, and there's also a few other potato chips that have now um, entered the market. In the breakfast category, there's oatmeal and waffles, and even cereal fortified with protein. Protein shakes have been around for decades, but the amount of protein in these drinks is higher than ever before, and the variety of products is also tremendous. We see many products that have protein combined with other functional ingredients, like coffee, coffee with protein, protein with probiotics, protein water. And then the products that are targeting the sports nutrition consumers are going to have the highest protein content and also have more of those proprietary protein blends with very specific products catered to very specific workout regimens and dietary guidelines. But let's take a look at some of the most popular claims surrounding protein. It's become extremely popular to call out the number of grams of protein or the percent daily value of protein on the front panel of a product, and the protein content doesn't necessarily have to be substantial, as we saw with the candy bar, uh, for a product to be calling out protein. The good or excellent source claim is defined by the FDA and depends on the percent daily value of protein in a single product. That's based on the recommended daily value of protein being 50 grams. So to make that good source claim, the product must contain 10% daily value of protein, and to make the high, excellent, or rich in claim, the product has to have 20% or more of protein. It's possible that um, two products with the same total grams of protein have different percent daily values. So one product may be able to make the high protein claim, whereas the other cannot. And that's because not all protein sources have the same PDCAS score, which is used to calculate the percent daily value. That PDCAS score is a measure of protein's ability to provide adequate levels of the essential amino acids for human needs. The higher the PDCAS score, the higher the level of the amino acids, and that's what you need to ingest because your body can't make it on its own. On its own. So foods with the highest PDCAS score are going to include milk, whey, casein, eggs, and soy protein, and I'm going to get more into those in a few minutes. 
Some other popular claims on protein containing products include grass-fed protein, uh, which is kind of a funny misnomer because the protein doesn't eat grass, the cow eats grass, but that grass-fed claim is now highly visible on a variety of dairy products. Um, grass-fed dairy is considered to have more omega-3s and three to five times higher CLA compared to corn-fed cows. Um, CLA has been shown to enhance muscle growth and metabolism, which helps the body burn fat. Uh, Dean food products have it on basically every product label now that grass-fed, and so does Horizon Organic, which is owned by Dean. So protein content is a key way for brands to differentiate their products and gain a competitive advantage by offering a higher protein content than their competition. According to new research by Global Market Insights, the protein ingredient market size is expected to reach $43 billion by 2024. And there are many sources and options for protein. The most popular sources of animal-based protein are milk, whey, and casein. Whey and casein are both derived from milk and have different rates of absorption. Certain consumer groups are going to be more discerning about the source of protein in their products. It's not just about the total protein content, but it's about where is the protein coming from. Um, milk and whey, are, whey protein are available in two different forms, both isolate and concentrate. Isolates are, more con isolates are more concentrated than a concentrate with a higher protein percentage, which is why they're more expensive. And that's why whey protein is definitely going to be considered the gold standard, um, among, especially among sports nutrition consumers. Casein is less expensive and absorbed slower by the body, but, there's more, but there are some interesting potential product opportunities for casein for sleep products or other instances where you'd want to provide the bloodstream with a slower and steady release of amino acids that could last longer. Um, milk protein contains both whey and casein and is probably known to have the cleanest taste profile of those three ingredients. The bottom line is that each protein source has its own unique advantages, so when you're selecting protein, what protein you want to use in your product, it's important to consider who your target consumer is and to make sure you're, so you're making sure that you're selecting the best source. There's also an increased interest in alternative sources and alternative ways to consume protein as many consumers are eating less meat. Pea protein is very commonly used, but now we're starting to see more brown rice protein because it has a better and cleaner flavor profile, or there's also a lot of blending of those two. Pea protein is usually blended with other plant-based proteins because of that undesirable flavor profile. Um, these two ingredients are commonly used in nut-based non-dairy milks such as almond milk, coconut milk, cashew milk. Um, even though nuts are high in protein, the nut-based milks contain relatively low levels of the actual name nut, and that's why um, they have a very low protein content. So anytime you see these nut you know, a nut-based protein drink, it's going to contain some other plant-based protein source in addition to that named nut, um, and it's most commonly pea or brown rice. Some other protein sources that are more fringy include algal protein or insect protein, insect protein typically being from crickets. Um, but I expect that to stay pretty fringe. You might have heard of cranberry protein. It actually has a very low protein content. Um, we've been working with a proprietary protein source from mushrooms that has a nutritional profile similar to, a, um, similar to dairy protein, actually. So that's another new emerging ingredient that is getting a lot of excitement from brand owners looking to roll out high-protein vegan products. And then on the culinary side, chefs are also supplementing with clean sources of protein such as lentils, nuts, quinoa, and legumes for product fortification. But for product fortification uh, and product development, those ingredients are very rarely used um, for a variety of reasons. So that's all I have on protein, and now I'm going to turn it over to Mike to tell us about what's trending in probiotics. Thanks, Laura. So we will start off with a brief overview of the probiotic market in general. Um, just as a quick introduction, I'm Mike Bush, president of Ganadin, and uh, we will talk about our flagship product, Ganadin BC30, in a little bit. But first, let's open it up with the probiotic market. So according to a, a 2015 SSI consumer survey, 70% of consumers are familiar with the term probiotic, and they specifically relate that probiotic term to a health benefit. We'll talk about health benefits in, the, in a little bit. Um, again, 30 to 54 percent of healthy consumers said they'd be willing to pay more on a skew-to-skew -skew comparison basis for a fortified product that's fortified with 
probiotics versus the SKU that is not fortified. Currently, the market is grown at about 6%, and it's a roughly $40 billion market by the end of 2018, um, with it pushing up into the, the $50 billion market as we enter into the 2020 timeframe. Um, currently, considered products con containing probiotics are considered cutting edge. As we can see in the news daily, we see all kinds of data being supported for digestive and immune and even mood and obesity and the gut-brain axis and the microbiome are being heavily researched. So there's a lot of work going on in this particular space. When we talk about that 70% of consumers want, being familiar with probiotics, we also have found that 70% of consumers polled would love to see their probiotics fortified in food and beverages versus 30% who would rather take it in a supplement. The main reason there being that supplement compliance is far lower than food compliance. When we look at consumers wanting a, a probiotics in a variety of foods, what we found is as consumers say, we don't want to just have our probiotic in a single place, whether it's a supplement or yogurt or whatever the case may be. So it, at least 22% purchase intent across all food and beverage categories, ranging from 22% from candies up to 38% for breakfast bars and nutrition bars. So as you can see, there's a, there's a great deal of purchase intent so long as those products are fortified with a probiotic and the, and the consumer is confident that it's in there. Consumers are also been showing a willingness to pay significantly more for, for probiotic fortified SKUs versus non-fortified. So again, 30 to 54% of healthy consumers said they'd be willing to pay more for a food or beverage product that contains probiotics. And among those same consumers, those consumers say they're willing to pay at least 10% more for products that are fortified with a probiotic versus their non-fortified counterparts. We've also found that across all age groups, consumers are willing to pay more. Initially, when this study was, was commissioned, the anticipated t target demographic were, were baby boomers, and what it turned out was is that millennials turned out to be the highest skewing consumer group, although the lowest consumer group that was identified was in the in the 19 percent range when they where the consumers have indicated they'd be willing to pay more for added benefits of a probiotic so across all age groups consumers are willing they're searching for probiotic fortified foods and beverages and are willing to pay more for those to so take that to dig in a little bit deeper 86 percent of respondents with children are more likely to purchase a product that's fortified with a probiotic than those who are not with the main purchase intent there being across all product categories being the immune benefit given by the, uh, by the probiotic. So digestive isn't as big of a concern with the, the, the parent buyer, but immune is a big concern with the parent buyer as they want to keep their kids in school and, and uh, keep their kids healthy. So we're going to take a step back now and talk about what probiotics are to clear up some mis misconceptions. So the WHO guideline and the WHO definition of probiotics is there are live microorganisms which administered in adequate amounts confirm a health benefit on the host. So the key points there are the they, microorganisms need to be alive. They need to be delivered in adequate amounts in order to confer that health benefit. And that health benefit needs to be shown in peer-reviewed clinical trials to support those health benefits. So the key points there are you have to have live has to be in adequate amounts, and those adequate amounts have to be shown to benefit the host. Without those things, it doesn't meet the WHO guideline. What you'll also find is, is that every single probiotic strain is different, so no two strains are identical. And what you find is, is that uh, you may find one supplier that may be trying to use general clinical data for a genus and species. And when you talk genus and species, you have for example, the genus would be a lactobacillus, the species would be an acidophilus, while the strain designation would be, for example, LA5. Or in the case of our probiotic, the genus is Bacillus coagulans, uh, the genus is Bacillus coagulans as the species, and then the actual strain designation is GBI 36086. All data relating to, to probiotic strains are specific to that individual strain. There can be massive genetic variances and massive variances in the efficacy, efficaciousness and safety of an individual strain as compared to their seemingly similar counterparts. And so you need to make sure as a manufacturer or as a consumer that you're looking at strain-specific data. 
The challenge is, in the probiotic community, is survivability. So your typical strains of lactobacillus or bifidobacteria, while excellent sources of probiotics and, have, and there are many, many strains that have documented clinical effects, when you're formulating a food or beverage product, it's key to have a product that survives not only the manufacturing environment and the shelf stability, but also that sh survives to colonize the gut. Most probiotics in the, in the lactobacillus or, or bifidobacteria categories require refrigeration. So the solution to that is using spore-forming probiotics when you're working in a food and beverage application in particular. Uh, the, the reason being is, is they remain dormant until consumed and upon consumption they germinate in the gut and they pretend to be, um, or they, they, they mimic the vegetative action of lactobacillus or bifidobacteria. So in the, case, in the case of Ganadin's flagship ingredient, Ganadin BC30, they're very viable cells with up to three year shelf life. They, they survive lots of different manufacturing processes. The, it's easier to say what it can't do versus what it can. And, and the, the current Achilles heel of, of our organism as well as all others is shelf stable beverages, UHT retort type processes. But in any re beverage that's refrigerated, that's refrigerated through, refrigerated through its entire supply chain, you should be in good shape. Currently, Ganane BC30 is used in almost 700 food and beverages sold in 40 countries, and almost 7 billion individual doses have been consumed by consumers without a single reportable adverse reaction. So just to give you some examples of some products that are on the market, they range from nut butters and spreads to frozen products like even breakfast burritos to healthy snacks the fruit products, which we've, we have some things like fruit purees and things like this that are HPP'd, baked goods, and we switch to categories as broad as, on the beverage side, as coffees and teas, refrigerated beverages like juices and, once again, HPP, um, sparkling beverages, kombuchas, sports nutrition. We've done a great deal of work looking at Ganadin BC30 and its synergy with proteins and so you'll find the, the ingredient in a good number of protein products, in particular powdered proteins and some, some refrigerated beverages. Um, Non-refrigerated beverages require either being in a powder blend or reusing some sort of dispenser system, such as the Karmacap. And then we've even expanded into the, uh, into the pet food and treat industry as we see more and more humanizing of pets. We're seeing more and more popularity with probiotics in general going into that pet space. And so thank you, thank you very much on behalf of Laura and myself. Um, our contact information is on the screen. Uh, if you need anything related, related to Imbibe or Ganadin, feel free to contact either one of us. Uh, we're always here for you to help. And uh, Laura, if you have any further uh, points for anybody, you can take it away. Thanks, Mike. I think that's it. And uh, thanks, everyone. We hope you enjoyed the webinar. And please reach out, as Mike said, if you have any questions. Have a wonderful day.